That's exactly yeah. how we use it. Yeah. Because you know, I have this paradox of choice. Okay. With, with the all the content they have. Okay. <laughs> and I'm always looking for something new, and then I just play on friends, just have friends on, and uh, yeah. The same thing happens to me. Yeah. I think when we're trying to watch something as we're yeah. eating or yeah. doing this or that. I just uh, yeah. I default back to friends because yeah. a lot of choices I know friends yeah, which actually tells you a lot about the effectiveness of the recommendation engines right? I know right yeah. <laughs> because at the end of the day they, they spend like I, I heard they had like a hundred and fifty million dollar um, budget for the recommendation engines and oh. yet nobody actually uses them I mean, I don't know if nobody, right? I don't know if we're a representative yeah. sample, but um, I don't. I because I know that there are a lot of teenagers who use them, and yeah. uh, you know, or, and, and I know that I know that my sister relies heavily on the on recommendation, the recommendation engine, engine. Okay. and I'm sure that she's clearly asked me not to yeah. um, mess with her profile in uh, any yeah. way, shape, or form. Yeah. I, I always tell that to my wife a lot. So, <laughs> but see, Annie, it, just you saying that I'm not sure that this is a representative sample makes this uh makes me you know this is why i'm talking to you because uh, of course you're a, um, a data science uh, manager at the central bank of egypt and uh, you lead a data science team this is why you called me out right away if and uh, and you called other representative sample uh, bit so uh th this actually would make this uh, conversation very exciting so welcome to the i am practice podcast where we talk to industry experts and uh uh, you know, people in the field who have really hands-on, a lot of hands-on experience uh, managing teams and um, uh, working actually in the AI, the ML, the data science field, and have actual experience to share basically their experience with our, our audience. So Basma, uh, let me ask you this. How did you get in data science? Well, first of all, thank you for hosting me. Thank yeah, of you course for having it's, me It's here. our pleasure and it's yeah. an absolute pleasure to have you. I'm very uh, excited for this conversation. Yeah. I joined the field of data science through passion for applying technical knowledge in a w for a wide range of problems, whether in the business world or for policymakers. This was the this was at the heart of it. What really attracted me was the breadth to which you can apply those technical skills. It's not just one problem. It's not a specific problem. You can apply it to a wide range of problems, and this is where the power of data science comes in. Yeah. Um, yeah, so one of the things I always love to say about uh, data science is that it's, it's a very uh, global uh, skill set. So today you could be, uh, you know, doing a supply network design use case and tomorrow you're just predicting the trajectory of the stars and you're doing a lot of stuff. You can work in space, you can work in uh, FMCGs, in, the, in central banks and banking and uh, financial institutions. So... Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background and um, how did you, uh, you know, uh, reach and, and, and become uh, the, the, a data science manager at the, uh, at the Central Bank of Egypt? Well, I studied actuarial science and finance yeah. at uh, the American University in Cairo. So that yeah. was my background. That was my bachelor's. After that, I went for a um, master's in operations research and information engineering mm -hmm. from Cornell University. And then I joined Ernst & Young. Yeah. I did a wide range of technical roles for them. The last, the very last was being a data science manager for Ernst & Young in Dubai. Yeah. What I did there was I worked with a lot of ministries, a lot of you know, g public sector type of clients. Yeah. And what I did day in, day out was go in, understand what problems do they have? Mm -hmm. What strategy do they have? What is the, what is the thing that's keeping this minister or that mm -hmm. you know, yeah. public figure up at night? Yeah. So understanding that type of problem, looking at the data that they have, and then recommending a roadmap. Okay, so this is the type of projects you want to focus on. This is the type of algorithms you want to look at and explore with using. And then this is the type of people you want to hire. This is the type of people you want to promote from within. Yeah. So devising the full plan for them from yeah. start to finish and implementing projects is what I did for yeah. Instant Young. Hmm. And I wanted to do that for Egypt yeah. and this is how I came in and mm. this is how I'm doing pretty much the same thing for the Central Bank of yeah. Egypt. I'm the head of the hub there. Uh, that is incredible and uh, what's, what's really exciting is that I think you started early on in the field before the field gets the buzz that it has right now mm -hmm. and a lot of businesses um, you know uh, now are going to are, are building their AI first strategies and right. Uh, everyone is, is talking about uh, we have to become AI first and they're hiring data science teams, they're hiring AI teams. So um, 
I'm really curious about your definition of what an AI first business looks like. Well, that's a business that has mm. um, data, data science, mm. and AI at mm. the heart of everything that they do. Yeah. So everything from revenue generation to cost minimization to mm. how to have our operations become more efficient, everything runs on yeah. top of data and data science. Yeah. Let me break that, that down yes, a little bit please. for you. <laughs> yeah. So you have you have a business. Sometimes businesses tend to focus on data science for just the revenue generation piece. So they yes. want to generate new revenue streams. So they say, oh, we want to use data science. Yeah. That's not what I'm talking about. That's yeah. part of it. Uh, other times they just want to go there for cost minimization. So we yeah. want to cut back on a certain department. So mm. give us the numbers to, to see if that, if yeah. that department is efficient or not. Again, that's not what I'm talking about. Mm. I'm talking about the full cycle. So yeah. everything you do, mm. if you're in policy making, it's every single department needs to be making decisions based on data and data science. Yeah. And then on top of that, it's your HR team, your IT team, solving mm. their problems using yeah. data science, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. So I see it really across everything and at the heart and the foundation of everything that you do. Yeah. Amazing. And uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting that you mentioned policy because uh, one of, uh, without really getting into the, de the details of it, we, once we, we were talking with the government and we were you know, advising them on their you know, policy making and how to use it and the policy making. And they told us a very interesting story. They, they spent two years researching, you know, having like a cigarette and a liquor tax. And they, uh, they actually launched the policy and two days later they had to just go back on it mm. because uh, it, it caused a lot of problems and a lot of uh, uh, business, you know, have, have really struggled with it. So they had to go back on it. So it's, uh, it's very interesting that be because, you know, policy making is really a, a, a very human thing to do. So right. it's very interesting that you say that AI can actually help in policy making and, uh, and so on. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We're yeah. doing that all the time at the Central Bank of Egypt. Yeah. I mean, we're doing that a lot and we're relying on it more and more. And yeah. it's uh, and we we have an, uh, an approach whereby we're starting small and moving fast. And yeah. we have a very big vision for how data science and, and AI yeah. is is going to be empowering policy making yeah. across CB. Yeah. But again, we're starting small, but we're moving yeah. very fast towards that. And th this brings me to my next question. So where do you begin? Of course, you're, you're working with the Central Bank of Egypt. So of course, I'm, I'm sure they have the resources and they have the knowledge and they have the know-how and they really understand where to apply AI. Though, just for like your traditional business, where do they start? How do machine learning projects actually begin? Do they maybe start from the business or and, and then decide on hiring data scientists or they hire a data scientist to tell them, how to start their AI journey or data journey, so. I think it mostly comes from, look, it depends on the business, right? Depends on mm. the level of maturity of the business, depends yeah. on the leadership of the business, yeah. right? If the leadership is, you know, up to date on how data science and AI can be used and leveraged mm. for decision making, then you'll find the questions coming from the business, naturally. Yeah. They will come from the business and the business would drive the entire process. Yeah. And I think that's the way you're gonna capture most of the value. Yeah. So for the AI projects or the data science projects that come from the business, where the problem starts from the business, I think that this is where the business actually generates the most of the value. Okay. Whereas if they start from, you have a data scientist there, or a data geek in the yeah. company, and who says, okay, I have uh, something very smart that I can do for you or build mm. for you. Yeah. Sometimes the business won't necessarily adopt that. Yeah. If so I mean, look where where I come from. It's um, it's a business first. So it's a, the business starts with the problem. They have a yeah. problem, and they have an idea, right? That yeah. this can be solved using AI. Yeah. And then they bring in the experts and say, okay, how can we actually do it? Can you help us? Yeah. Can you engage with us? So it's it's a it's it starts from the business, and yeah. it needs to be owned. My opinion, it yeah. needs to be it needs to continue to be owned by the business. By the business. Very so interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so um, I have to apologize to the audience if uh, there is a background noise. Actually, uh, I, I, I wanted to really thank you for coming today because it's raining cats and dogs outside and uh, you were stuck like at the entrance because you couldn't, you know, uh, uh, cross the streets while, ev while water is everywhere and you, you jumped off lakes <laughs> and, uh, and climbed mountains just to be here. So thank you so much uh, for being here. And... Uh, I understand there's a lot of obstacles today, but we'll, we're, we're going through this and we're going to, uh, to finish this episode. So thank you very much for coming. It's my pleasure.
Um, so, so the business has to own uh, the use case. The business has yes. to. Uh, but don't you think that sometimes the business is really, you know, uh, unaware of the power of data science to solve this specific? So how do they really know that this is a data problem or a data science problem? Right. So they know that they have a problem. Yeah. And this is where we come in. Yeah. Right. And as I said earlier, the more the leadership is aware of how data science and AI can be applied, yeah. the more you're going to be part of these discussions where business is just stating that they have a problem. Yeah. Sometimes they come to you. Sometimes you go and say, I can solve this problem for you. Okay. But the problem starts with the business. And you're absolutely right. Yeah. Sometimes the business doesn't know yeah. that this problem can be solved with data science. Mm. Or they've tried a version of data science or a version of what they would think of as AI and yeah. it hasn't worked for them. Because yes. obviously lack of tools, techniques and methodology and approach. Yeah. And so you can have a lot of misunderstanding with the business side as you're yeah. discussing. But I, but I genuinely believe that when you have those discussions in a, in a consistent fashion, you're going to be able to bring your audience up to speed. Yeah. And so um, one thing that I that has worked particularly for me as as, yeah. as the head of the hub was basically going in and having periodic meetings with the business side. Yeah. Right. So not wait until you're done with the model, final iteration, then say, hey, I've mm. I've solved the problem for you. Most yes. probably no one will adopt that. Yeah. But having some skin in the game early yeah. on and getting feedback as fast and mm. as frequent as possible yeah. that has definitely helped which mm. of course of course you know this yeah. but just that it, it you read about it but yeah. then you apply it and it works yes and sometimes you go into those feedback meetings and it's like you know this was not what we were expecting or the mm. model is generating a forecast we don't really like yeah or this or that but then you need to have those discussions yeah. and eventually the business will own the final product if yeah. you just keep Keep at it, yeah. right? Don't be discouraged that business did not buy from the first go or for the yeah. from the second go. You have to keep going and doing it in a very, very persistent manner, such that yeah. in the end they will actually own the final uh, own the final product and they'll be very proud of it and they will showcase it to everyone and yeah. they'll and they will be your champions. And we've had a few success stories yeah. internally with that. So you have to always include the business in whatever you're doing um, at all times. Right and uh, right, uh, but what do you do s s since, of course, the business has, and I'm sure you've dealt with that a yeah. lot of uh, um, in, a, in a lot of uh, situations. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the business comes in with a, pre a preconceived, uh, well, want. Yeah. So they they they, you know, they want to see, for example, a certain chart or a certain dashboard and they don't want to see anything else except this dashboard that they have uh, in, in mind. mind. Mm -hmm. And um, as a data scientist, you really know that this is not going to be useful in any way, shape or form. <laughs> and you have to, you know, ad, ad, you, you want to give them what they need, but at the same time, you understand that the data that you're sitting on, the data that you're seeing can get a lot of other valuable insights and uh, it can be much, you can build models and you can build, you know, other insights that can really be transformative and can be really effective. Uh, so how do you manage that? How do you balance between really adhering to the business need and at the same time, you know, you, the data expert, you can see what you have, you see, you know, this treasure uh, or, or these jewels, these crown jewels in the data and you want to show it to the, so how do you manage, how do you balance between what the business wants and what you see as really important and really uh, should be a priority in your, in your uh, daily work then? Look, I, I think with the, with the, I tend to come from a background that actually trusts a lot what the business wants. Yeah. So I, any feedback that that's coming from the business, I take that into account. So if business says, I want to see this dashboard, I'll give them this dashboard okay. and some more. Okay. But the first is I will answer your need. Yeah. And then, you know, if you want to know the time, I'll tell yeah. you the time and then I'll show you how to build the clock basically. Yeah. So yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll start with telling you the time. Okay. That's the, that's the, that's the, that's yeah. the premise. Yeah. And so what we, what has worked, what we're experimenting yeah. with is actually a wide range of things and it depends obviously on the audience each time because yeah. sometimes you're dealing 
I mean, we're saying business, but uh, is the business someone at uh, an analyst researcher level, or yeah. is it someone more senior in the in institution? Is it a, mm -hmm. you know the head of the organization? Who are you talking to? Yeah. And so that actually determines uh, quite a lot. So who is the audience? Yeah. So that's that's uh, that's one. Giving them the answer that they're looking for first, mm. and then and then actually showing them the added value, um, mm. the added value next. Yeah. I think that with the more projects that you do with the business, they will, they will catch up. Yeah. So they will be able to see that there is more on the table and that they can extract more value from this. Yeah. But you have to be, again, you have to bring them on this learning journey, yeah. show them. And, and again, a lot of showing. Um, one of the things that has, that has definitely worked for us is, mm. you know, when you build a dashboard that's very cool and you actually take the time with the business side to play around with it yeah. and see what are they seeing exactly. from their perspective. How are they looking mm -hmm. at it? Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but really just showing them what they need first, be very aware of who the audience is and then bringing them yeah. along that journey. I love, I love what you said about telling them the time and then showing them how to set up the clock. That's uh, yeah, your own point. So, um, um, one of the things uh, that is very common with junior data scientists is that, of course, especially in, 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 in a context of banks and, 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 you know, institutions that has a lot of data, mm -hmm. usually they want to experiment a lot. And, um, you know, um, with data science especially, it's if, if you can go, you can easily slip into this rabbit hole where, uh, rabbit hole where, where which in which you have a lot of things you want to do, which uh, you have a lot of experiments that you want to do, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of insights that you want to generate. So h how do you uh, create like KPIs for your team? First of all, let me ask you first, what, how does, what does your team look like? My team mm -hmm. <laughs> comes from, mm -hmm. uh, my team um, looks like, um, it comes, my team comes from two different backgrounds. So yeah. I, Half, almost half of my team comes from an actuarial science background. The yeah. other half comes from computer science, computer engineering yeah. background. Mm. Um, half of them are girls, half of them are guys. Yeah. I mean, so diversity. So that's, that's, so that's great. So yeah. diverse. Yeah. We we don't have subject matter experts on my team. I don't have an economist on my team. Yeah. This is something I'm building to. I'm build. I'm working. I'm going towards. Yeah. I'm, so I'm relying on subject matter expertise from other teams in the central bank. Yeah. So that's. Um, so I that's one. I, I would guess they have a lot of economists. You're absolutely <laughs> right. I guess yes. that. Yeah. there is an abundant uh, abundance of economists. Abundance of economists, <laughs> yeah. and that's why when yeah. when I started hiring, the strategy was I'm gonna just focus on data scientists. Might I want yes. my technical team? Yes. You want to build the capabilities. Capabilities in, in house. Yeah. Yes, that's the yeah. that's the goal. And then uh, they have varying years of experience. Some of them yeah. are fresh grads. Some yeah. of them have come with. Yeah more number you know yeah. one to three years of experience yeah. and they're building and i'm very proud of how mm -hmm. you know the data scientists that joined in 2021 mm -hmm. right now they have accumulated more way more experience yeah. and they've built in they've built their experience within yeah. the central bank so i'm very proud of that yeah no, that's amazing because you know it's i think working just working in the central bank is 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 very exposing to uh to uh, to a lot of things that are happening in the country, and you can work in in a myriad of use cases that uh, that I think are very exciting. So, when do you draw the line that all right, stop experimenting? This is I think is is, is a good enough model to uh, you know show the business and so on. Because as I said, it can be a rabbit hole where, where you never finish your work. Where, where, where especially with data scientists, you're never satisfied with what you have. You want to do better. So, how do you draw the line? How do you uh, keep your team uh, in check to meet deadlines and to um, uh, to build good enough or impactful model and uh, you know prioritize impact and and uh, going to business or going to market rather than just keeping uh, keeping the experimentations uh, going hmm. it's the <laughs> it's mostly the deadlines <laughs> yeah, really. the deadline. there is no yeah. fancy way of putting <laughs> yeah. this it's just you have a deadline yeah uh, you know, and, and it depends on the business, right? Yeah. So uh, for certain businesses, it's a launch date or yeah. it's uh, the end of the year. We need to do something before uh, then or the beginning of the year or yeah. this quarter. Uh, for, for Central Bank, it's another timeline that we're working against. So yeah. we need to publish something, then that's the timeline. So yeah. then we work backwards. Okay. The Look, the challenge, the real challenge is to, is to basically say, this is 
good enough and it's not really just for the junior data scientists sometimes i struggle with that myself yes, to say course, this yeah. is good enough mm. we're gonna go and we're gonna just get feedback and yeah. we're gonna build on that because you're absolutely right the number mm. of experiments within a model across yeah. models with different data with points different tunings and different, different uh, data sets and yeah it's it's i was i was speaking earlier with one of my senior data scientists yeah. yesterday yeah. and they were like um it looked like we had eight million combinations that we could <laughs> iterate yeah. from and i was yeah. like and so what did you do and he, well, he, had, <laughs> he had they had the good sense to actually shrink th this down Amazing. to nine thousand nine hundred or something okay. like that iteration so you're absolutely right but yeah. then you work with the team you just keep them informed okay yeah. so these are the constraints the, this is the deadline we yeah. need to actually publish something by that timeline yeah. so informing them keeping them informed keeping them in the mm -hmm. loop and then we actually make this decision together and sometimes it's really when the main stakeholder is available so if yeah. the, let's say the, the the actual deadline is in two weeks but the key stakeholder is available today we're going to present it's today it's with wow. whatever we have so wow. <laughs> that's a, a very stressful day i think when uh, <laughs> when the deadline is after two weeks and now you have to present today it's uh, and this happens and happens, this happens yeah. and, and it happens in a way that Again, you're just aware of everyone else's timelines. Yeah. Um, it's a large organization and we're just, I think we're just prepared. And I think, again, the learning curve wasn't just for the business side, it was yeah. also for the team. Yeah. So with time, we also built that rhythm of, okay, so if we need to churn out a presentation of where things are today, we can always do that. We can always, yeah. you know, drop the pen on the modeling piece and then jump right into presentation mode and then and then present the yeah. next day we can we can do that we've built that internal capability yeah. and it wasn't the case before yeah, it was more like if we need to present next week we prepare a week in advance yeah, and yeah. we need to drop the pen on the modeling That's way earlier not realistic right so it's uh, you have to uh, you have to adapt we, quickly we adapted yeah. we adapted yeah. this is what happened so yeah. deadlines adapting flexibility keeping uh, everyone informed yeah. so i guess deadlines are just the eternal tool to keep you productive huh? It is. Yeah, yeah. It is. Um, you know, actually, in in my team, and I think mm. I really, um, I'm very humble to be working with all of them yeah. because they come to me with that. But we need to know what is the deadline now, so that we can work against it. So they yeah. actually seek a deadline, and yeah. I and I and I and I really like that about them. Yeah, you have a very disciplined, uh, <laughs> disciplined team. Uh, like we never mentioned that. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Uh, so, um, um, you know, many many companies are hiring data scientists. Sometimes they have no idea what they should do. Mm -hmm. They have no idea how to manage them. They have no idea what kind of KPIs to uh, uh, to to um, um, to have them evaluated upon. So. Uh, so I think this is I think data scientists will be you know very uh, <laughs> very earful now but um, <laughs> I don't know if earful is a word is earful a word it's not a word so um, um, they'll be very you know uh, like observant of what you're going to say Absolutely. so yeah so uh, <laughs> what kind of KPIs how do you manage a data scientist so if you're so now think that you're um, a business line manager and mm -hmm. you hire you have a data scientist in your team how do you manage them right yeah. so i me i measure them against actually three yeah. key pillars and uh, and 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 there are three angles yeah. the first one is the quality of the work that's coming out of the data scientist yeah. quality and technical excellence is the first yeah. is the first piece so how how many reviews does this piece of work need to go through before i can actually publish it okay. and showcase it yeah. so that's the quality part yeah and that's actually the main distinguisher between someone who's on the more junior side of data science and someone who's more on the senior yeah. side of data science. Mm -hmm. So that's the first pillar. The second pillar is how do they navigate working with other team members? So how mm -hmm. do they collaborate? Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a softer skill, right? Yeah. So that's something, that I, that's something that I work really hard to gauge yeah. to understand, okay, so if we have if you have two or three projects running in parallel and then the team is working on them how are they working how yeah. are they teaming how are they resolving issues internally yeah. um, do i hear about it or do they just manage it internally how, what's mm. happening so how are they teaming and 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 that actually is key because yeah. again with that environment with any environment that would have a lot of changes you want a team that's actually 
collaborating, working, yeah. collaborating, working yeah. in harmony, you know. Internally and externally or just within the data science team? I think that would depend, yeah. right? So, I mean, when the business, so there was a situation at the very, very beginning of the data science journey, mm. of our data science journey, we had a situation that was, okay, we needed to publish certain results and that was an external, you know, yeah. external to the data external science team problem. Yeah. And the two data scientists I had at the time, they rolled mm. up their sleeves and they were like, we're going to put in whatever time, yeah. effort it takes and we're going to make the hub work Amazing. and we're yeah. going to make this project work. And yeah. they did. They delivered wow. on both. Mm. So it's, it's, it's teaming and that was one of the things that actually, and they, they worked together in ways. So for example, if one of them, they were both working on a project and now we got this external request that we needed to attend to. And I could see them trying to alleviate pressure off of each other, and that was actually that went into their both, um, yeah. both reviews, and it was actually a plus for both of them. So, yeah. so teaming is the second thing, and then how do they? The third pillar is actually how do they personally develop themselves? So, what are they? You know, if they're not on the job, if they're not yeah. working, what are they doing? Yeah. Right? It, how are they developing their subject matter expertise? How are they developing their data science skills? How are they reading up on what's new in AI? Yeah. So those are the three main uh, pillars against which the data scientist, I would, I would manage a data scientist. Incredible. Uh, that's, um, uh, this was an incredible framework to manage data scientists. And um, I think a lot of data scientists now love you because, of course, uh, um, you know, people hire data, and we we actually we've actually met this a lot when um, uh, data scientists were hired to do data science, and then they just do like glorified Excel sheets mm -hmm. with you know a few charts, and of course it's very frustrating for them because they're very curious. They want to you know uh, do play with models, you know, build optimization models, build uh, d uh, different predictive models, and so on, and play with it, and and just you know get into the math and get into the mm -hmm. uh, the building and tuning and so on and usually this is not what's requested fr uh, from them um, so um, i think thank you very much for you know um, explaining your framework and i think it's uh, it's um, um, it's a very precise one to be able to manage a data science team so um, now one of the things is um, that we get asked about a lot is that how do you improve a model in production so usually you have a base model that just that just goes into production and the business so now uh, of course the business once you just alter the word accuracy they you know they they just you know go cra all crazy on it and they just focus on accuracy and and forget everything else forget impact forget uh, you know how how effective is this model in uh, in life and in, in real life and so on so first of all does machine learning get smarter with time? <laughs> That's a difficult question. Uh, I don't know if it gets smarter with time or with more data or yeah. with more experience yeah. working with it and understanding. And it, and it really, the answer to that would really depend on the data you're working with. Exactly. Yes. Right. So if the data you're working with yeah. is noisy or yeah. has missing values or was mm. constructed in the wrong way has actual yeah. construction problems then your machine learning models will not be able to do as good as they're expected to do yes and we actually see that a lot yeah and uh, if you're trying to now cast or forecast an indicator and you're not sh you know and you're trying to do that with a data set and you have problems with the data set doesn't matter how powerful your machine learning model is doesn't matter how many experiments you mm -hmm. actually do in in order to for parameter tuning or yeah or just to check you know mm. different types of models it doesn't matter the results are still not going to be improved they're they're still going to be misleading mm. and when you show it to the business side they're going to be like this is not what we had in mind and mm. the bi and again i do trust the business the business knows yeah. knows a lot about the subject matter they yeah. they, they have the subject subject matter expertise but um, it depends on your data, really. So yeah. I don't know if it it it's with time data. or if it's with better data or yeah. <laughs> more experience working with this data. Yeah. So actually, one of uh, one of our very um, uh, good advisors is uh, name is his uh, his name is Devin, mm -hmm. and Devin told me this this um, this quote that I'll never forget. He told me that data has a shelf life. 
so um, it, it really depends on the data so you, the data that you have today might not be relevant tomorrow and the data that you have tomorrow might not be as good as the data that you have today so it might not improve your model or um, you know incrementally improve the model in any uh, in any way so um, let me ask you this um, when is it when is it a good enough model to deploy Wh when when do you say that this is a good enough model? Uh, what kind of you know like accuracy do you uh, do you have in training, for example, to say that okay, this is a validated model. This is a good enough model to be pushed to production. Right. It's not against the specific metric. Yes. Right. So for us to say this is a good enough model, it needs it needs to pass a lot of tests from the business side yeah. more than actually a certain metric because you can yeah. show them again think about the context of where we are so uh, central mm. bank is full of statisticians economists people yes. who are very academically savvy yeah so showing an accuracy metric will not will not help you yeah. <laughs> let me just tell you that much yeah so and i think that's the right way i yes. think it's not just about the accuracy it's not just about a certain a certain metric or even a collection of metrics yes the model needs to be so first of all, test it, test it against different times, understand how it works in different time periods. Yeah. Again, thinking about the context of, of, yeah. of that I'm referring to, but then afterwards it needs to make sense for the business. And the business in my case is not one team. It's a wide range of teams and yeah. it's a wide range of teams with different opinions. And sometimes you challenge the model against subject matter expert yeah. type of models. So when it passes all these layers, then you can put it into production. Yeah. So it needs to pass a lot of challenger models yes and then you can and then yeah. you can actually take it to production so i think this is why uh, many would say that machine learning or data science in any data science project is one of the most multidisciplinary projects that any organization can take on mm -hmm. and uh, uh, i like very much that you're very empathetic towards the business and uh, you know many data scientists can um, uh, can you know ride on their high horse and they say that the business just do is not aware of the data we, we have this incredible model and the business just doesn't doesn't really understand the genius of our model and so on but uh, I think as you said at the end of the day the business is your customer and if they don't adopt it 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 has no use so you have to be very empathetic towards them you have to include them um, along the journey of building the model validating the model testing them and making sure that the subject matter experts are really you know at ease with the model and they can actually uh, use it and um, and it's practical for them to be to be something that they depend on on their daily job because at the end of the day if it goes wrong it's it's their responsibility and and they can and they have a lot at stake of course so uh, uh, look it works yeah it works you just need to see it it works yeah. if you engage them yeah you no know, and 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 in cer for certain projects we've had as many as 15 workshops after yeah. we finished the project but after those 15 15 workshops just working on just on one on the one results okay on one project i yeah. we held 15 not less than yeah. 15 workshops and each would be anywhere in the vicinity of one to two yeah. hours wow and you have the business come and just ask questions and let me tell you, mm. we know what's in this data now. Mm. Everyone knows what's in this data, like the back yeah. of their hand, because yeah. we've diced it and sliced it in, all, s in yeah. all ways. We've answered all questions. But next time any, any of those teams is working mm. with an external party, an external party to the organization, they would showcase this work. And they would showcase it as their own. Yeah. And they would be presenting it and, and, and actually defending it and, and using it for decision making. And when I've seen it work, yeah. I was like, it's great. It doesn't matter the time it takes. Yeah. It will work. Yeah. And everyone is happy at the end of the day. So it's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a worthy time. In so 15 workshops, two, uh, two hours each is, is like 30 hours of discussions and talking. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, many data scientists maybe would try to avoid, you know, talking and, and, and being at the spot. But I think, as you said, if it, 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 if it works, you have to do it. Yeah. And, 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 and I think it, it's, absolu it's absolutely necessary. Yeah. The flip side is you have a dashboard, you have a model that no one is using. And yeah. that really, that keeps me up at night. Yeah. <laughs> if we built a model and the results are there and we're not sharing them with the right yeah. stakeholders or the stakeholders are not asking for them or not using them for decision making, yeah. that's what's keeping me up at night. Yeah. Then I know that, okay, what happened? Is it a shift in priorities? Yeah. 
Did we lose track of time? Why is it not no, being adopted? Yeah. Um, so that's... Uh, so it, it falls down to usability. Yes, so usability. Yeah. Absolutely. So what are you most excited about in the data and AI field in general? I'm excited about the opportunities yeah. that it has for a lot of the businesses in Egypt. Yeah. I think we're just scratching the surface. Yeah. And I know that the potential is huge whether it's working with the data that you have internally in your organization and actually maximizing the potential of that data to drive decision making in the true sense of the word yeah. or it's to get data from outside that's yeah. currently available whether you're buying it or building it or generating agreements to yeah. acquire it and then merging that with your data and allowing and unlocking more even more, more use, use cases, cases and, yes. and more value for your business yeah. so i'm just excited for the opportunities i think it's huge and i and i'm sure we're, we're just uh, scratching the surface. the surface so of course after listening to this podcast a lot of data scientists would be very interested to work in your team so what kind of advice would you give them to you know <laughs> i don't want to say for you to hire them because i don't want to give any promises but uh, so what what kind of advice do you give to career data scientists in general well uh, <laughs> look mm. i tend to give a lot of advice even during my interview process so if yeah. for a candidate that is not meeting the requirements i tend to actually work with them so th yeah. The reason I'm sharing this is because I think it's a v it has to be very tailored to the person. And yeah. that's what I found within data science. Mm. People come to data science from different backgrounds. Yes. So look, we've all seen that Venn diagram where data science is at the heart of statistics, mathematics, yeah. computer science, science, and the business side. Yeah. We've seen the Venn diagram. Yes. Yeah. I use it as a tool to actually know that the strength that I have or the strength that the candidate has and where that candidate needs to evolve their skill set. Okay. So if you're someone from the business side. So you already, you have an asset, yeah. right? O and then it boils down to assessing your level of understanding of the other mm. two disciplines, right? So yeah. statistics, math, and so that the foundation yeah. of data science and machine learning, and how much of programming mm. do you know? How much of computer science yeah. and coding do you know? So my advice would always be along the lines of where you currently are and what type of skill sets do you need to, to, to develop? Yeah. I come from a school where I don't necessarily care if you know how to code in a certain language. As yeah. long as you know how to code in a certain language really well, yeah. I'm really solution agnostic. Yeah. It doesn't matter as long as you get the job done. Mm. We have, of course, certain tools that we're using, obviously frequently, but again, I'm not too stuck on that. That's not yeah. where, I'm, where I'm stuck. I, and so I, for me, I think if, if, if someone wants to apply for the team, that's, that's the framework I usually use. And it depends on where you are as well in your journey. So yeah. if you're someone with a couple of years of experience and or a few years of experience and you're trying to break into the field of data science, I would give us different advice of, than if you're yeah. someone who, who's a fresh grad and you're trying to break into the same field. Yeah. You know, I would say to some people, pursue mm. a full program in mm. data science that will give yeah. you the wide range of skills you'll need yeah. to develop. But that I will give all that advice to only a specific set mm -hmm. of people. At, uh, it depends on where you are in your life, yeah. really. But uh, but use that framework, and and, and yeah. but and I think yeah. and I think it works. Incredible, it works. incredible. So uh, uh, we have come unfortunately to the end of our episode. <laughs> so uh, do you want to hear a data joke? Can I say, can I tell a data joke? Please. Do you want to hear a data joke? So please. <laughs> why do you call an indecisive decision tree? Why? A tree. <laughs> It's not a good one. All right. So <laughs> that's why this has been incredible. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I understand all the, the uh, you know, the obstacles and the adventures that you had to go through just to come here. So thank you so much for coming. This has been incredible. I hope this is just the first of many. And thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for, for having me. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you, Asma. <laughs>